everybody. It's Dr. B again. Um, as the uh, title slide says, we're going to talk about branch and jump instructions today. Um, kind of capping off with, with showing you how to build some simple loops out of these things. Before we do that, we're going to talk about um, a, a few instructions that'll help us get there. Um, as part of this, we want to review the program status register. So you've seen this slide before, but uh, it bears repeating because it, it'll be important today. If you recall, the status register is a, an 8-bit register, and each bit represents some um, particular state the, the, the last instruction um, caused in the, in, in the CPU. And the four we, we care about are the N, V, Z, and C bits. Bits 7, 6, 1, and 0, respectively. We pretty much ignore the others. Uh, the N bit means that the last instruction created a negative result. And that simply means that bit 7 of the accumulator was set to 1. In other words, um, if we look at the 8-bit accumulator and we uh, uh, interpret it as a signed result, that leftmost bit or the most significant bit um, will be, uh, if it is 1, that tells us we have a negative result. Bit 6 is our overflow bit, or the V bit for short. It means that the last instruction caused an overflow. In other words, if we interpret the last instruction as, for example, a signed add or a signed subtract, bit 6 will tell us if that signed operation overflowed. Bit 1 is our 0 bit, uh, and it is set to 1 if the result of the last instruction put a zero in the accumulator. Simple as that. Uh, any other uh, result in the accumulator will make the, make the Z bit be set to one, meaning it's not zero. And then bit zero of the status register is our carry bit. It means that the result of the last instruction uh, caused a carry out re uh, result. So it's set to one if there was a carry out, set to zero if there wasn't. The, one of the reasons we're, we're talking about this is all our conditional branches are based on one of these four flags. The negative flag, the overflow flag, uh, the zero flag, or the carry flag. Now, let's talk briefly about the increment and decrement instructions. Uh, start by saying these only apply to the X and Y registers. I don't believe there's an increment instruction for the A, A register, if memory serves. Um, each of these is equivalent to your plus plus in, in Java. INX simply adds one to whatever's in the X register, and it could it can wrap around um, to zero if need be. DX or decrement X subtracts from the value in the one from the value in the X register. So this is X plus plus. DEX is X minus minus. And we have similar instructions for Y. So Increment y adds 1 to y, decrement y subtracts 1 to y, so y plus plus, y minus minus. And one thing we need to note is that these instructions modify the program status register. So what we're seeing here is um, the documentation taken from uh, this URL, and you can click through that in the slides. I think we talked about, about that uh, URL in the earlier uh, presentation. And here we, in this example, is for increment x by 1. So x register gets the value of x plus 1. And then over here, we see, um, let me get rid of that. Uh, it's saying it's misspelled, but it's not. So I was hoping to get rid of the squiggles. Anyway, over here, we show the flags that this um, instruction can modify. And we note that it, it can modify the in flag, meaning it can create a negative result. Um, and it can modify the Z flag, meaning it can create a zero result. In the, um, and it, I realize now that um, the, uh, I have been, when we talked about the status register, I talked about it purely in terms of the accumulator. I, I, it hadn't caught, occurred to me before, but it can happen in terms of the X and Y registers as well. So 
Um, here we're modifying the X register, but we also can get a, um, a negative or zero result out of it. All right, so I'm going to do a couple of examples just to show you how we can uh, manipulate the status bits based on the, the code we write. So I have a two instruction sample of code. I'm loading the value 50 into the X register, then I'm incrementing X. And then we're going to see how things change at each step. All right, after we load a 50 into the X register, the value in X will be 50. And I've shown it in binary here, uh, so you can, because that'll help us uh, look at, at some of the other values. Um, Z flag meaning is the val the result zero? Obviously not, so Z flag itself is zero. It would be set to one if this were all zeros. The end flag of the status register is solely based on that leftmost bit. So here the leftmost bit is zero, there the end flag is zero, meaning we, we have a positive result in this register. And yes, load X can modify these registers. Um, the next thing we have is increment X by one which takes it to a decimal 51. And again, here is the binary for convenience. Once again, we did not get a zero result. So the Z flag is set to, to zero. We did not get a negative result because the leftmost bit of the result is still zero. So it's still a positive result. So that's kind of a trivial example. Let's look at one that will um, do some more interesting stuff. Here, manipulating the Y register, I'm loading in 254, and recall that 255 is the largest value we can have in an 8-bit register. So we're pretty close to, to the wraparound point here. So I'm loading 254 into the Y register, then I'm incrementing Y twice. So let's see what happens. So I load 254 into Y, so now the Y register contains 254, and here is the binary for convenience. Notice the leftmost bit is a one, meaning this can be interpreted as a negative result if we interpret it as a signed value. Even though we're looking at it here as, as unsigned, um, if we interpret that same bit pattern as signed, it's negative. So the end flag does get set to one because it's always going to mirror that leftmost bit. Now, we have some ones in our results, so the Z flag does not get set. We're going to increment it one more time. That gives us 255, which is a result of all ones. Once again, leftmost bit is one, so the negative flag gets set because it is um, negative if we interpret it as signed. Um, there's ones in the results, so the Z flag still remains zero to say that it is not a zero result. We increment this one more time, and if you add one to 255, you get zero because it's an eight bit result. 255 is all eights, we add one to that, it becomes all zeros. Um, and uh, we get a binary result of all zeros. Uh, the end flag goes to zero because we now have a positive result. Leftmost bit is zero. The Z flag goes to one because the entire result is, is all zeros, so it is now a zero result. And I just realized that we actually are going to do that because it would, in fact, cause a, an, um, a carry out if, if we did it that way. Oh, I'm sorry, though. It would not because um, the increments don't affect the carry flag. My bad. But they do affect N and Z. All right. Now, let's talk about branching itself and how um, that is manipulated by, by these status flags. To talk about branching, first we've got to review the program counter. So remember, the, the 6502 has this special register called the PC, or the program counter. Um, if we think about every instruction is stored in memory, and if you look at this, um, this code over here, we have our assembly that we write uh, in the rightmost column. In the middle column, we have the actual hex or binary data that is created 
and placed into our program itself. So when th the assembly code gets assembled down to machine code, we'll see something that looks like this. So each value in this machine code column is what the, the code in the assembly column is, is going to be assembled to. And in the leftmost column, we have the actual address where that machine code is going to reside in memory. Actually, it's the starting address of that first byte. So each instruction in memory, therefore, has its own address unique to that instruction. The program counter stores the memory address of the next instruction we're going to execute. So because it holds an address, it is 16 bits long. And it's the only 16-bit register in, 64, in the 6502 architecture. Um, the default situation is if we're going through our program instruction by instruction by instruction by instruction, one after the other, all the way down the page, the default situation is the PC gets incremented by one instruction every time. Now, note that one instruction may not be a single byte. Um, as we see over here, some instructions are three bytes long. Some are sing a single byte long, some are two bytes long. So the PC gets incremented by the amount of, uh, by the, the number of bytes it needs to go to the next instruction. This is if we're simply going down the page in a linear fashion. Now, branch instructions play, uh, shake that up. So we can load the PC with something other than the next instruction in memory meaning the next instruction to be executed would be something somewhere else on this page. It allows us to jump around. So now we need to talk about how we do flow control or branching and assembly kind of from a, from a high level. Assembly does not have loops. There's, there is no strictly loop con uh, construct in assembly. We do have some simple methods, or really they're simple, they're called subroutines, and we'll talk about those at, at near the end of the semester. Uh, we also have uh, conditional branches, which are uh, sort of a limited form of the if statement. Um, they, they're a little more squirrely to put together than an if statement, but uh, we, can, we can do that. The idea is that we branch if some condition is true. We also have the notion of unconditional branches where we always branch straight to something. And that's similar to a go-to in, in other programming languages. Um, a branch can go forward, meaning the next uh, value in our program counter will be greater than our current program counter. Branches can also go backwards. So the next value in the program counter would be less than the current program counter. In other words, forward goes down the page if we're looking at our listing, backwards goes up the page if we're looking at our listing. So let's look at the, at the types of conditional branches. And there are, what, two, four, six, eight of these. First, we'll look at BMI and BPL. BMI says branch on my, minus, meaning we branch if the end flag is set. If the end flag is set, we have a negative result, so we branch if that is, is true. BPL, branch on plus, branch if, if the end flag is zero, meaning we have a positive result. By the, created by the last instruction. Pretty straightforward. Uh, BCS, BCC, branch on carry set. In other words, branch if the last instruction created a carry of one. BCC, branch on carry clear, meaning branch if the last instruction generated a carry of, of zero. Or well, branch if the carry is currently one or zero is the way that works. It doesn't necessarily have to be the last instruction, but um, it's branch if the, the status register shows it shows a zero or one. Uh, BVS and BVC do the same thing for the overflow bits. So branch on overflow set, V equals one, branch on overflow clear, V equals zero. Those should be pretty straightforward. It's the last two that, that, that their names kind of make it less intuitive. Branch on equal, meaning Z equals one. We had a zero result. Branch on not equal, meaning z equals zero, a non-zero result. And that's not, uh, it doesn't quite make sense uh, on its face. But we'll talk, talk about that uh, in a minute as to why that works. So uh, first of all, just kind of the format of, of branch instructions. Uh, 
all of our conditional branches, whether the BMI, BPL, BCC, BNE, whatever, the actual argument is not an address. It's a signed offset from your current position. So in other words, for an example, branch on minus of 0F. So 0F means positive 15 if it's interpreted as signed. So we branch on my current position plus 15 bytes. Similarly, BPL of 90, oops, did I, 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 it looks like I made a mistake there. Hold on, let me correct this very quickly. I'm gonna pull up my calculator and we've got a hex, nine zero is going to be, Yeah, I'm going to just make a guess since it's kind of hard to calculate negative numbers on the fly like this. Probably that is negative nine. I'll double check uh, later on um, and fix it in the comments if it's not right. Um, I think of those two, F7 is probably negative nine. Um, but uh, let's just assume it is. Let's assume that evaluates to negative nine as signed. Um, that's going to give me a PC equals PC minus nine. So we, we would move backwards. Um, doesn't really matter because we're actually going to ignore what we do in this slide. It's very, very difficult for us as, as assembly writers to calculate what those offsets are. In particular, uh, because those offsets are going to change if we um, insert code uh, above or, be or below these things. Um, so in, in general, we don't do this. Instead, we use uh, labels as our branch targets. So for example, I have a label that is start of loop. The assembler, when it assembles your, your code, is going to figure out what that address is. And it's going to do the math so that your, your conditional branch has an appropriate offset to get to that label. In other words, you don't have to worry about all this. Just use labels as your branch targets and, and everything will be good. And it will do that whether the, the branch is forward or backwards. All right, now I promised we'd talk about uh, branch on equal and branch on not equal and what their relationship is to the zero flag. So first bullet, what does equal have to do with zero? So think about this. We have a comparison between two values. We're trying to decide, is some value P equal to some value Q? So subtract. Subtract Q from P. So if P minus Q equals 0, that means Z equals 1. In other words, the Z flag has been set. We have a, a 0 in our result. And that implies that P was equal to, to Q. If P minus Q is not equal to zero, whether it's positive or a minus result, it implies that P was not equal to Q, meaning P equals Q is false, and the zero flag will not be set, and therefore we are not equal. So um, as we'll see later, we, when we do a comparison instruction between two values, um, it will actually use subtraction to, to perform that comparison. In fact, it probably uses the same hardware that, a, sub, that a, a, a subtraction arithmetic instruction is going to use. And it's going to set the Z uh, flag accordingly. In other words, Z will be one if our two values were equal, Z will be zero if they were not equal. And we can branch on those. All right, so let's look at this in the context of, of, a, of a simple loop. Um, particularly, we're going to look at, at, at branch on not equal. So I'm going to set up my loop by uh, putting a 9 into my X register and a 0 into my A register. Um, this is just a label. could be anything, but for convenience, I'm going to call it loop. And I'm going to start by adding 4 to my accumulator. So my accumulator was 0 and add 4 to it. I don't really care what I'm doing here. Just to have some. That's my loop body. Now I'm going to decrement my x. x equals x minus 1. When we uh, 
hit zero and actually that's when x equals zero there when we hit zero for x that will set z equal to one because keep that in mind and then my next instruction is branch on not equal to loop in other words while x is still somewhere between zero and nine i'm going to go back to here and keep going go down by one is it zero yet nope go here add four take x down by one is it zero yet nope go back to my loop add four subtract one from x is it zero yet well maybe it is zero if it is zero we're done and we move on to the next instruction so you can kind of think of this part actually these two instructions the dex and the branch not equal um, as the uh, loop header in a for loop right now where we're modifying our loop variable and uh, checking if it against some condition uh, when, when that happens We'll look at uh, some other things we can do with loops later, but right now you can you have everything you need to know to write a counting loop using the X and Y registers, the increment and decrement instructions, and then a, a branching instruction. All right, last thing for today, uh, the unconditional branch, the, the JMP instruction, um, this is your go-to. So if you've seen if you played around with uh, C or C++ or some other languages, they have a, um, a go-to statement. Go to some label in, the, in the, the program. Go to jump to an arbitrary point of the program. We don't use go-tos when we're using a high-level language. Uh, they, they, just, they tend to be too dangerous um, and, and, and cause too many problems. However, at the assembly level, it's one of the few tools we have to use so we have we just have to do so carefully uh, with jump you pass it a full address and it will jump immediately to that address um, and execute the, the instruction of that address it literally writes that address to the program counter so that um, the next instruction is whatever is there um, and the block says these can be uh, helpful to us uh, making if statements later all right, that is it for, for branching today. Um, again, if you have questions, let me know, and uh, I'll be glad to, to help out.